All right, so what, what we wanted to talk about today was, um, you know, obviously it's the goal of all of us in the room to create um, customer obsession, right? We want to create customer obsession um, within our companies for our customers, and we also want our customers to be obsessed about us. And so this is something that we've, we're focusing on at Epsilon, something that we're trying to drive, and something we're trying to help our clients achieve. Um, and this is more important than ever. Um, we've got some stats that are... Yeah, I mean, so we talk a lot about segmentation, but we really don't spend a lot of time talking about, like, generational issues, right? And it's really predominant. This afternoon, we're going to end. Um, Sid Boyd is um, from Epsilon. She'll be the only, you know, Gen Z on the panel, right? But this is a connection issue that we have with a lot of our now consumers with some of the highest disposable income. We want them. But... They want to also feel special, and we have to appreciate like the needs and desires are different, right? At the generation level, segments and deciles absolutely important, but like we have generational disconnects, not just in what we say, but where we're saying it, right? So, just some interesting statistics. I'm not going to read a ton of this for you guys because we want to keep going, but we have to start to appreciate that the expectations are very high. They want to feel very special, and it's not just the mature programs that have the mature client base. I look in this room and, and coming in here, I've, I've worked probably with seven other people at seven different companies over my career. I'm not the face of the consumer of the businesses we're working with anymore. So we have to relate, we have to change. One more, Brad, go ahead. And they're requiring a lot more personalization. You know, we heard them joke about, you know, the email that came with the name. It's not that anymore. Like, that's not even personalization. That's like, it's a hoax, right? We have to get better. And they're expecting it. They're going to give you data if you do the right things with it, and they're going to be the first ones to take it away if you don't. And if you don't, they're going to become skeptical, not just of your program, but obviously of your brand. So it does become very important for us to understand. And I'm actually going to say, I'm going to encourage us to change the word from like micro redemption and start talking about it in terms of micro experience. Because redemption is transactional, and that's not cutting it anymore. I do just want to point out quick, this is all Forrester research data. So Thank you. I want to make sure that we're citing it properly here. Um, and it's, uh, but, but this is super interesting to us because um, you know, as we look at the generational differences, we see that there is a growing importance for being, providing that personalized experience around the customer. So um, I love the presentation earlier today around like the shiny objects. And I think one thing that we do within loyalty often is we, we get super excited about these like emerging technologies and these emerging trends. And we think that it's gonna be kind of a silver bullet to solve all of our customer problems. But at the end of the day, it's, it's about the basics and this will never change, right? This is the basics of loyalty. And regardless of the technology you're using or emerging channels or emerging trends, we believe these basics will always be true. So um, we're going to spend just a little time today talking about these, but one thing that we want to do is we want to hear from you about how you're doing with the, some of these basics. We realize that there's a lot of vendors in the room. You're not all you know, running loyalty programs, but if you are a vendor, we'd love for you to answer this on behalf of your clients, maybe like how do you see them doing? Mm -hmm. So the, the first trend or the first kind of basic that we wanted to talk about was really knowing who your customer is. And when it comes to knowing who your customer is, there's obviously different levels of data that you could be collecting about your customer. Um, I organize these sort of from left to right in terms of like the, probably the easiest to kind of the hardest things uh, in terms of data you can collect about your customers. So, you know, demographic data, obviously, you know, where do they live, who they are, ages, how many people are in the household, things like that. Relatively easy to collect, right? We do that through, um, you know, when they sign up for the program, or we do it through surveys, we do it through customer research. Um, and we use that, obviously, to do like a high level of personalization. We use it to do some sort of segmentation. Um, transactional, most loyalty programs can't survive without the transactional data. So again, that's a relatively straightforward forward one to collect. Um, but the two on the right are a little harder, right? The behavioral and the psychographic data it's harder to get to that data because you have to ask your customers and you don't often get a large representation of that data. You have to, um, you have to kind of, I don't know, 
use, use a sample to um, get an idea of what the total looks like. Um, but the, the brands that we work that um, are sort of best in class, they do a good job of, of collecting this data and using it to personalize the experience. So we're gonna get to our first poll question here for you. And this is where we're gonna use Mentimeter. But um, on a scale of one to five, there are obviously brands out there who are doing a really good job of collecting and using customer data to know who their customer is. And then there's others on the other end of the spectrum that aren't really doing much. So we're curious where you guys think you fall. So we're gonna, we're gonna bring up the first Mentimeter question. So if you've got your phone pulled up, you should see a, a survey question. And as you're answering it, it should show up here on the screen. All right, so there's, so there's no experts in the room. <laughs> Nobody's using d data to really know who their customer is. But there's also no novices, so I guess that's a good thing. All right, so now the question is why? Why aren't you all experts? And you can answer this multiple times if there's multiple reasons. Is it because of limited budget, limited time, you don't have the expertise? I'm curious what you think. All right, interesting. So remember I said you guys are gonna be happy to know you're not like struggling alone, right? This is a great way, so we see this all the time. The thing when I look at here is when we talk about things like, and I'm not saying it's not important, budget, but then we wanna talk about connected with our consumer and that kind of thing. I also challenge us to think about what are your use cases and how are you, what's your measurement? We're gonna talk about that. That was the fourth one on our little list today. But think about when you see these things today, there is very, budget is a very key, it drives all of us, right? Like there's wins, there's losses, there's home runs, there's fails. And unfortunately, budget is such a driver of fails, you have to get very prescriptive about how and what you're doing and how you're communicating and connecting and how you're leveraging your value prop. So, Brad? All right. Um, so let's go back to our gift cards. Because, <laughs> so AutoZone is a client of ours, and we think that AutoZone is, um, they've, done, they've made a lot of progress in the last few years on getting better at knowing who their customer is. So we're gonna give away a couple of AutoZone gift cards. So we wanna hear from somebody about how you've used customer knowledge to improve your loyalty experience for your customers. $25 AutoZone gift card for whoever volunteers. It is Father's Day next week, Daniel. All right, we've got a gentleman in the back here. We'll make him say something before you give him the gift card. <laughs> uh, we're trying to personalize the experience that the customers have. So treating, uh, I work for Ford Motor Company, treating a lease customer, obviously they're li less inclined to care about accessories, for instance. So putting to the forefront the things that are important to them, uh, like subscription, Sirius XM. Um, so we're using uh, the data to try to make sure that we're creating a personalized experience for our customers. Thank you. What was your name? Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. Anybody else want to share? How are you using customer knowledge to improve the loyalty experience? Is anybody that said that they were on the proficient side that answered proficient? And if you were a vendor, please tell us that you're a vendor and what you're doing. But yes. Um, yeah. Am I answering the question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that we. Oh, okay. Hi. Hello. Um, so we use the customer knowledge in the sense of, hey, Branch, uh, transactional data and um, member profiles. So we look at, uh, we work with a lot of airlines and hotels. We look at, um, are they a co-brand card holder? Are they an elite member? Which level are they? And um, different transactional behavior with how many flights or stays they've done. Uh, and then we build propensity models 
um, for our product, which is purchasing of coins, um, to see you know who are the key segments, who are most likely to purchase, who needs certain offers to purchase, build models based on that, and put those offers out in the market. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so the next sort of basic that we wanted to talk about was um, providing value to our customers. So this might come to a shock to a lot of people, but value isn't what we say it is, it's what they say it is, right? It's actually interesting, one of the th quotes that was up when Brad and I were putting this together, I started to laugh, one of the quotes says something like, treat people the way you wanna, they wanna be treated, and I was like, gosh dang, I'm like this many years old and I realized my mother's been wrong her entire life. Like she said, treat people the way that you wanna be treated. And in fact, I think that's the way loyalty programs operate, like we are these creators of things that we think people will like. Now there's a lot of research and there's a lot of things that we can do, but because the driver is that funny thing called budget, it becomes what you can do what you're limited to. So the point of value is treat people the way they want to be treated, which is also why I challenged us to change from micro redemption to micro experiences, right? Because for them, their redemption is an experience and it doesn't have to be transactional in terms of its points, right? My free upgrade is a benefit. It's an experience for me. It can be seen as a redemption in traditional world, but it made me feel good. And actually, I really appreciated that I could take a small nap <laughs> on my way here, right? So we all know there's the, thank you, the rational and the emotional elements that we have to do, right? So our CFO wants to make sure there's a return on investment. We have a limited budget. Things have to cost something. There's an exchange rate, like it's currency. On the other side of it, you have to balance that between the behaviors, how people feel, what they want, what experiences are gonna resonate. And it's really hard, because some of that stuff you can't measure. And if you look again at the demographics and all of the different people that we're trying to assimilate a value proposition for, we find so often there's one program, one structure. That's it. And we can say that, there, well, there's this tier, but what is happening in the middle of all of those things that are the knowns of the program, right? And honestly, it's usually poor communication driven by text messages or, or emails, uh, and that's it. And we think that that's good enough. I will tell you later on today when you hear uh, our coworker who's, like I said, Gen Z, she's gonna tell you, it's not, it's not enough. So we do have to balance the rational and emotional, but I think that the emotional side here is starting to really change and we're on the cusp of something really different that's coming that we're not, we can talk about the basics, but we're not prepared for what technology and channels look like. So, I am, I am in control. Come on, Brad. <laughs> anyway, so one of the thing you have to realize is that even though you have these you know, programs that may be very linear, and they have uh, tiers that are very uh, defined and understood, Every single person in those tiers, based on whatever reason, has a different value play. They have a different opportunity. There's something you can squeeze from them, but you have to return something that they're gonna want. What is that incentive? And if we have one job to do, no matter what tech stack you're on, no matter how old, no matter what channel you're using, we all have one job, that is to influence the path to purchase. And if we are not doing that with all of these things that we have as tools effectively and with the right value to the right consumer, we're not getting very far. The bloggers then become the bad guys, right? So everybody wants something in return. So it's really important and I think it's really cool some of the stuff you guys are talking about in terms of like the propensity modeling and all of that. It's gonna get crazy, ChatGPT, all this stuff, it is coming. And, and the world that we know is changing. But what will not change is the consumer. They're still just people and they want something for a value. So figuring out what it is and having a dynamic way to create a value prop for your consumers and your members that allows them to feel like that program is very specific to them can actually happen inside of, I'll call it an umbrella program, the same structure the traditional programs have. So, we're gonna talk just a second about how um, uh, one of the brands that we work with spends a lot of time actually creating, they have an umbrella program. 
Um, but they have different types of programs to actually get to different types of customers that are like subclubbish. They're different like niches that they go after and it's a different treatment strategy. And it still sits with inside the bounds of a traditional loyalty points based program. So for you guys, the question's gonna be, how dynamic is your value proposition for your members? And I said value propositions because, quite frankly, there's technology can allow you to do as many value propositions as you want, right? Oh, we have an expert. That's exciting. I know. All right, so um, one more question um, here is what prevents you from creating dynamic value? You'll notice these questions are very similar throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So the most interesting thing about this is number one, there was an expert on the last page, so whoever you are, I hope you raise your hand. The other thing is, is that previously when we looked at this question, it was budget really drove a lot. So now we talk about kind of feeling handcuffed, it sounds like. Um, expertise, time, lots on other. So I wanna spend a second there. Is anybody willing to say, uh, you know, when you answered other, what that meant for you? Um, yes, um, we are not loyalty providers. We provide to the loyalty industry, but I'm a loyalty consumer because I'm a member of, an, of, of several things. So I'm trying to translate your question to our company and to my experience as a user of loyalty things. And it all has to do with all the parts of the chain and it the chain breaks on the weakest part. And within, within our company, why are we not dynamic enough, enough with our propositions is training of people. Because apparently the concept that we are selling is just too hard to grasp for all the, the people in our company. What happens for me as a loyalty consumer in the airline that I'm a platinum member with KLM, I'm a high tier with a Bonvoy. But the people who I get into touch with who didn't come up with the ideas are the people who are not aware of what the loyalty actually means. So when I check in at the Marriott Hotel and it says elite members here and normal members there, and there is nobody at the elite stand, or the normal thing is going five times as quick. What? What? The same goes with, um, with uh, well, the same goes, so that's the other, it's the training of the people. I can talk for hours about this. Sort of. I, I would agree with that. I had a, an airline experience recently where they lost my baggage and they, there was no acknowledgement of my loyalty status or at all throughout that entire experience, right? It's totally disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because training, I mean, obviously we're in this industry, training of the frontline member, the frontline worker is the hardest part. It is the hardest part. And the question I always ask, like, why isn't there a program for that? Right? So let's talk about, um, Walgreens for a second. Walgreens, spends a tremendous amount of time on frontline worker. They have program for frontline worker. They work hard to make sure that, and it's a very, uh, it's a very, there's a lot of turnover, right? Retail is a very high turnover. But one of the things Walgreens does is first of all, they leverage data. I mean, they could have been a use case for a lot of different things. We used them here because Walgreens does a tremendous amount of touch and learn. Test and learn, not touch and learn. <laughs> uh, the end of the day, what they really focused on was making sure that not only were they capturing data, but they were trying to solve a lot of problems, right? Walgreens, for a long time, was known as the, the pharmacy, right? 70% of their business is done in 25% of their footprint. They have a whole C-store concept that most people don't really spend that much time in. So what they really wanted to do was reward folks for continuing to leverage the, the it's the prescriptions on subscription, right? Like the monthly turnover. But when they were in this, so there's a value prop for that. 
While you're in the store and you're shopping around, it's points-based, right? You have, you can get double points for this, or you could only qualify for a discount if you were a member, right? They wanted to solve several problems at one time. And then when they started to realize, like, there's other ways that we need to have people engaging, we integrated with Fitbit. So the brand became a part of your everyday life, and it rewarded you for moving, they, you know? And it is a, a fun, the moments, those experiences that are happening in between and how they're really creating different value propositions and engaging with the consumer when the consumer isn't in the back of the store or isn't in the C store part. They're out on a walk with their dog and they are connecting with that member. Does anybody else have anything to share on this? We spent a tremendous amount of time understanding the emotional drivers for customers at the customer level, being able to identify, you know, what things actually drive them to, to make decisions and to stay sticky from an emotional perspective, as I said, which is the opposite of using a transaction or a discount or something like that to, to wave, wave a carrot around. But more importantly, we understand that trade-off between the two. So dynamic value propositions to me are specifically that, trying to figure out, you've got a range of things that you could do. Can I understand at the named level of a customer in the moment where they're trying to make a decision, how to give them something that's gonna create that long tail or that stickiness with having to buy it from them every single time. And some of us are only motivated by money and others are highly motivated by an emotional experience. And if we know what that is, we can provide our clients with uh, a lot more leverage because oftentimes those emotional experiences are cheaper than the than the transactional discount itself. There is still this big gap, and I noticed it earlier on one of the earlier panels between what people think the customers want and what the customer actually want. And my big eye opener, and I've been dying to say this, was a guy with a t-shirt who said, this is not a bug, this is a feature. And that for me says it all. It's what people come up with. Within my status with KLM, apparently they forced the attendant to come up, especially to my seat, and ask Mr. Koyman, are you sitting okay? I don't care about being picked out. and having. It has no value at all for me. When you order something at Hudson Bay, they have seven questions relating to loyalty before they effing get your thing to. It does not add at all. And I ask those people, why do you ask me all these questions? And then they say, they, I have to. So I think there should be, there is so much room in improving your service in actually asking the client what counts. And like Dave is saying, that may be transactional, it may be experienced for everybody, it's different. So that's what I wanted to say. And the hard thing is that it changes over time too. And so it's not always the same thing. Depending on the situation, it could be totally different. Yeah, it is actually interesting. And I think that it was uh, Mary Pilecki yesterday, if you were here, she talked a lot about Preference Center. Wouldn't it be great if you bought something and you didn't get an offer for something you did not want? I mean, wouldn't it be great if companies had like, I don't know, data on who you were, what you like, and then they let you tell them more? Wouldn't it be, it kind of sounds like a loyalty program, right? But it doesn't, like this is where this, this massive disconnect is. We, this is not new stuff. Like I've been in this industry for a very long time and it seems funny that, it, you know, 20, 25 years later we're saying the same things. And it just means we haven't gotten it right. Well, ex exactly to add to that, because speaking on behalf of several of our clients, actually, the intention is there often to do it like that. And then because we keep hearing that, oh yeah, we should, we should, we should, and then somehow caught up by time, and then you know a quarter passes, half a year passes, and yeah, other things are put in more priority. So it's not like, yeah, pro don't know how to do it or uh, don't want to, but just being, well, not prioritizing it uh, the way it should be, I think. Um, so <clears throat> now you have a value proposition issue, right? So we understand we have work to do. But then the next question, so you know who they are, 
You know what motivates them. What are you doing in terms of your connection? What are you creating in terms of, and I'll say memorable experience because it's not necessarily always what you're, it's how we deliver it, right? So channel matters. A couple things, when we start talking about what people can talk about, again, are you letting them redeem rewards the way that they want to, right? Or what's the path of least resistance? Which quite frankly, and it's fair, it's real. It's 99% of the industry. I mean, we're a provider and we see it all the time. Path of least resistance. And we started, uh, what did they say yesterday? We start with day one and we talk about day two. That's what uh, Bill Swift said, yet. And I'm like, yep. And how many people get to day two, right? Good enough. That's what they, it's like, and we get it. Things change, priorities change. Somebody's gotta change a POS system or they're replacing the email provider, whatever it is. And then we lose focus of the one thing in the middle, the consumer. So are you letting them choose what they want and how they wanna receive it? Are you doing one size fits all? This is a little bit about the value proposition, but this is also like offer strategy. This is, you know, again, back to the basics. But even in small things that can be redemption, or as I said, micro experience, is badging, right? This influencer concept now has become so big and it's not leveraged nearly enough in our day-to-day -day programs to allow our biggest, cons the biggest consumer, the biggest advocates of our brands to have a voice, right? So badge them, let them re-recognize. When people see that, there's something, there's some type of human need, we aspire to the things that we don't have, a badge, right? So is it all the same, right? Even if it's different, you know, even if you're sending different offers out to different segments or different deciles, is it just offer-based, right? Are you creating a dynamic value proposition with all the tools that you have to create a program that feels to the individual consumer like it's built for them. Technology is there to do that. Again, like why don't we do this? <clears throat> and then finally, how are you communicating? How are you connecting with them? And is this, I mean, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, is it all synchronized? Lots of breakdown happens when you have this department saying this over here, loyalty saying this over here, and then I get an offer for this, I get an offer for that, and I don't really know where it's coming from, and I don't earn anything here, but I earn something there. It's confusing, and when we talk about making it simple, it's not just the loyalty program. I mean, brands have to understand that this is the universal communication and connection this, that you're creating has to be synchronized with all parts. This is, <clears throat> Walgreens did a great job on this one too, they're not my use case for this one, but, we'll, but the one thing that they did is they put the consumer first, your experience with Walgreens usually has to do with frontline worker. They're usually very pleasant, they're very knowledgeable about the program. When <clears throat> you come in, their entire marketing strategy, their loyalty program sits at the heart of their enterprise marketing strategy. That is, it is not the one-off, it's not the, you know, forgotten about under the, you know, stairwell in the back room. It is the heartbeat of their marketing strategy and everything that they do revolves around it. All of their DMS, all of their emails, SMS, all of it revolves around my, my Walgreens now. So getting into you know, these personalized customer experiences, we do spend a lot of time still talking about them at the segment level. And I think that's okay, I think that's great. But technology does really exist to get it to the one-to-one. -one. And so what are we doing for this micro experiences to create a journey that looks very different between Brad and Shamba? Even though we fly the same flights, we go to the same places, we eat the same dinners, like we're very different people and what I want is very different than what he wants and how I get there. If I can get that from my brands that I'm with, they're top of my brain, they are top of my wallet, and they are, honestly, the, the first ones I sign my kids up for, so. All right, so connection maturity. How, um, how mature do you guys think that you're using all your channels? And Dave, this is gonna be a great one for you. This was already done, but last night, Dave and I had a drink, and he was like, just kind of done with email, like, right? Because it's, it's the primary channel. So I'm interested to understand, 
How many of you are using different channels to create meaningful connections? And is it synchronized? And you do not get to say expert on this one. You told me too much. I'm well, surprised this nobody thinks they're a novice in any of these kind of things. That's, I guess that's good. So then the next question, which I think is going to be really telling, is like we have all these channels available to us. Lord knows we're all using them in some way, shape, or form is what prevents you from creating them. There's, we know there's, you spent, your brands are spending money on all of them. Is anybody here using TikTok as a channel? Is anybody here using influencers as a channel? Some on the influencers. I'm going to say TikTok again because I. Anybody using TikTok as a channel? A little bit? Okay. Okay. I mean more like for work. <laughs> um, it's actually interesting, right? Like these channels that are in, in our face and we're not. There's nobody, nobody in here is taking that leap. I mean, a little bit, but there's not that much happening on channels that are in the face of the next generation of consumer. It's, you know, interesting to me. And if we want to talk about a connection, I can't get my kids off it, so. All right, <clears throat> so let me tell you um, a little bit about why we picked Duncan as someone that does a really good job with this, is that they really do a good job with partnerships, too. They spend a lot of time um, understanding. They're, they're mobile first. Like, you know, like, I hate to say it, I'm looking in this room. I know, like, most of us are mobile adapted. Like, I grew up with a pager, right? But there is a lot of people that um, are coming, and our consumers that are coming up, they're mobile native. Like, this is, if it's not on their phone, it's not real. It's literally not real. They figured this out a long time ago, and their program has, since inception has been, and, very mobile and they work hard on partnerships to connect like the NFL to your experience. So I live in Minnesota and yes, we do have a football team, right? Nobody knows that because they never win anything. So we don't have the same pride as like the Patriots, for example, where there's hardcore pride. I have coworkers I've seen like tattoos, like it's just crazy. Again, I would never put a biking, you know, <laughs> Minnesota Viking on anything, but you know when we talk about these connections They try and get you when you're not in their store and ultimately that is where we are missing a lot here So really quickly for a $25 Duncan gift card anybody want to tell me how you've personalized your experiences or your connections with your consumers? Um, how, how have you improved it in the last five years because let's say five years has been a huge turning point for channels anybody? Well, speaking on behalf of another client, um, I think what they really did well was adjust their communication, not only in terms of the language that they use, but also uh, the type of language. So different communication to business traveler versus senior people traveling, younger generation, because they really need a different message. I mean, you're not going to explain check-in to a business traveler, but it's very valuable information to a senior traveler because they get nervous. So. Yeah, personalization on that level, I think, is a very uh, good one. It's actually interesting to me, like, who I look like when I travel at work and who I look like when I travel for pleasure. I am 180 degrees, right? And my kids are 4-H kids. They show livestock. I, you know, here I'm, like, in the city. I'm having a nice dinner. I'm having wine. I feel like a big girl. I am, like, the truck stop girl, you know, hauling trailers full of livestock. And I'd get treated the exact same way, no matter what, right? So where's my connection? All right, finishing it off. So we're getting the uh, this thing from David back there, and it's lunchtime. So we're gonna skip the last um, basic here, which is we're not gonna do the poll, but it's basically like you have to measure what you, 
you know, you can't improve unless you measure it, right? So I've got three gift cards left here. The, the example we were going to use was, um, I'm going to skip over all this because we don't have time, but The Gap is another client that we think has done a really good job of, um, of measuring the results. So every time they push out a promotion, they have pretty rigorous requirements on getting the data back from us, for the loyalty provider, to use it to inform the next decision. So um, first three hands that go up that say they're experts at data measurement get a gift card. <laughs> oh, we got one. All right, look at her go. I love it. Do you want Gap or Duncan? Gap. So when he talks about measurement, when you are looking at it, you guys are obviously mentioned you're doing a tremendous amount of segmentation. You guys measure at the same segment level? Okay, who else is good at it? Yeah? Duncan. Okay, I'm sorry we didn't have time for measurement, because measurement's a cool topic, but. It's the most one more. important one, right? Anybody who can drop one more like piece of wisdom on us gets the last gift card. Yeah, we're gonna actually ask somebody to say something just quickly about measurement. So I'd love to hear from a measurement perspective, what, is, what do you struggle measuring the most? $25 gift card. Hi, um, I'm Kelly. I'm with Collinson Group, um, Value Dynamics Division. And um, I wouldn't say uh, we're at expert level, but one thing I'm finding just from an industry perspective is skewed level data. So you, I'm sure you all are familiar with the Banyans of the world. I think that. Um, I'm seeing partner strategic partnerships with companies that are able to get to the SKU level data. And an example I was thinking of earlier was um, I go to Marriott and you know the, the data shows just what I spent from a folio level. But if you get down to that SKU level, do they know that when I arrive, I like to go to the bar and have a glass of champagne and just mm -hmm. decompress? Or you know, getting to that SKU level data I think ties in nicely with the ability to get to an expert level of um, measurement and really personalizing the experience and, and having people see what is relevant to them. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> thanks, Kelly. So um, thanks for joining us today. Um, sorry we didn't have time to go through all of that, but hopefully you learn something from your peers. Hopefully you see that you're not alone when it comes to some of these basics. And I think um, the, the parting thought that I would like to leave is just that, you know, even though there's a lot of other things to be focusing on there, none of us really say we're that great at the basics. And so, you know, um, I think returning to the basics has a lot of value for royalty. And again, I will say it is more important than ever. We, are a, we have a generation that's coming that will see you one time in the like, what do they used to call us? Like the Mountain Dew generation, the Gen Xers, and now it's like, it's like not even a thing anymore. Like, what's Mountain Dew? Like, they, their ability to have and process information is so light speed that you don't have a 30 second impression anymore. You have, you know, millisecond timing for impressions. Using your date, getting it right, and using it appropriately has never been more important. Perfect. All right. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>